Community Relations with JCPS, and she's also Vice Chair of the Youth and Education Committee of our club. So she will be introducing our guest speaker. Welcome, Abby. Thank you. Well, um, I have been blessed this afternoon to be given the task of introducing a man who truly needs no introduction, nor does he honestly prefer them. So I'll be brief. There are a thousand things that you already know about Dr. Polio. You know that he was appointed superintendent of the 29th largest public school district in America in 2018, which by all accounts was the beginning of one of the most difficult and historic years for this district. You know that he has spent his life's work in improving this district uh, as a social studies teacher and a coach at Shawnee High School in 1997, and then as an assistant principal at Wagner High School, and then principals at Doss High School and then Jaytown High School after that. But what you likely don't know about Dr. Polio is that unlike many public figures, what you see today is what you get always. He has no official demeanor, and what he says to you is not rehearsed. Uh, you may not know that he is a leader with the truest tenacity I have ever witnessed, or that his passion for the work is so infectious that those of us who work for him uh, find ourselves spending an hour or two after the end of the workday uh, just to get it right. Finally, you may not know that Dr. Polio has a bit of a temper, which we graciously attribute to his Italian heritage, <laughs> but it's driven by a deep impatience for amending wrongs committed over years and years that have put up barriers for kids whose futures rely on adults getting it right. I hope these things come alive for you today when you hear from them. And since patience is not one of his many virtues, with no further ado, I introduce to you Dr. Marty Polio. Thank you, Abby. Appreciate happy to be here. And by the way, if you all don't know how hard Abby works, she got married on Saturday. Um, so congratulations, a officially Abby got married and she was, I think you were back to work on Monday or Tuesday at the latest. Um, Monday afternoon. That's what I thought. So that says a lot about her commitment to the work in JCPS as well. Thank you for having me here today. I'm excited to be able to, to talk to you, um, obviously during very challenging times um, throughout uh, in education, in the district, the community, the state and the nation, we all know that. Um, I don't think there's ever been a more critical time for education than right now. And so I'm, I'm pleased to come talk to you. I think the last time I spoke to the Rotary, it was um, I had just gotten the job. You all gave me a nice lunch there, but I guess we can't do lunches uh, here. So looking forward to get back in person with you soon, um, as, as soon as we can, and, and talking to you in person. But I know this will have to do for right now. First off, I want to say thank you to your the Rotary's commitment to JCPS. I know we have Iroquois and Western High School principals on here right now, um, but you know, you guys have had such a commitment to supporting the schools through scholarships and, and it's impacted kids' lives. And I also wanna put a pitch in for Evolve 502 because I know that support you've given to Evolve 502, the announcement that came out a couple weeks ago that in the class of 2021, every single graduate from JCPS will be guaranteed a two-year scholarship to JCTC or Simmons College of Kentucky, and the opportunity for a plus two, which means two more years at the University of Louisville. That is a game changer in this community. Um, so I just wanna thank you for that, your support of that, and I think long-term the effect and impact that will have on children's lives in this community is immeasurable. And I think we have to get to a place where we say a, a JCPS kid who, who walks into a kindergarten class is guaranteed a college scholarship when they graduate from high school. That is the game changer. It's happened in other communities and it's finally happening here. And thanks to the Rotary for doing that. So today, I'm gonna to talk just briefly about short term. I really wanna talk much longer about long term um, and vision for this district long term. And when I say short term, I mean COVID-19. We are in the crisis of COVID-19 right now. Um, that we're all very aware of, and education is in the center of the controversy, whether that is going back to school, whether that is having athletics, um, all the things that, um, you know, are, are talked about every single day, and we find ourselves squarely in the middle of that. Um, of the 76 largest districts in America, I believe we are now at 75 out of the 76 are beginning virtually. It's not anything that anybody wants. 
Um, but I also knew when the CDC guidelines came out in mid-June that for a district like JCPS or any of the other 76 large districts to implement that in a safe and effective way was going to be an enormous challenge. We know we didn't see that the cases go down in July um, and we had to make that difficult decision that we were gonna start virtually. That's not anything we want. I'm a JCPS parent as well. My daughter wants to be back in school. I want her back in school too. Um, but we gotta be able to do it in a safe way. We've got thousands of uh, employees that are high risk. We have thousands of kids that are high risk. Um, so we are hoping after six weeks that we're gonna be able to transition back I've talked a lot about how we want to make sure that this time, NTI was very proud of what we did in the spring. There were challenges, but on the drop of a dime, we turned, and, and I think we did better than most urban districts in the nation, and you can look at the numbers and see that. But we wanted to be much better in the fall as well. And so, you know, we, we've done this NTI 2.0. do more live classrooms. Um, obviously, you've seen, uh, many of you have seen the news. We have some kids who um, um, circumvented some of the um, technology. They outsmarted us on some of the technology. Um, and so, you know, that's, that's happened in, in many districts right now. The hard part about this, none of these platforms are perfect. Um, they all have their strengths and they all have their weaknesses. Um, and kids are pretty wise. I think they're much better technology wise than the adults are. Um, but, you know, we had an option. Uh, we had Google Meets and Google Meets said, well, usually in the other districts that have done this, that goes away after two or three days. Well, I was a high school principal and I'm, I know kids. And when kids know they can get away with something, it's not going to stop. Um, so we made a tough decision to say, all right, let's pivot. Let, let's get to Microsoft Teams, which has a little more security for us. Even though Google was the one that worked so well for us in the spring, let's make that change. So we got to be flexible. I mean, I think that's the way life is right now in COVID-19, flexibility being important, being able to maneuver, um, and, and that's what we're going to do. So our goal is to get back as quickly as possible. I hope we can do it. I know the state is coming out with some metrics which is what superintendents have been asking for in this state. Give us some metrics that we can recommend to our board that says clearly, this is safe to go back to school, this is not safe to go back to school. And then we can monitor it with the community and say, here's what has to happen for us to be back in school. Um, and I believe we should be getting that soon and I think that will move us forward. Uh, but we know 2020, 2021 is not going to be anything like any year we've ever seen. Um, and I'll say this, um, you know, my three years in this district, uh, the challenges we have faced um, have been immense. I remember when I first got the job, six weeks into the job, um, we had this solar eclipse, if everyone remembers the solar eclipse. And um, I tell the story a lot, but, you know, I was brand new at this. And, you know, the, the decision was to have school or cancel school since the solar eclipse was coming at 225 and kids were being let out of school at 2.20. And the advice was just tell kids not to look up at the sun. And I said, well, I'm a high school principal, and I know if you tell kids not to do that, they're going to do that. And I had this vision in my mind that, um, you know, over the weekend I didn't get any sleep because they're going to look up at the sun and it was going to be like Raiders of the Lost Ark where, like, kids' faces are melting. Um, and I, six weeks into the job, this was going to be my legacy as a superintendent. Um, and I thought we got through that and it was fine, but I thought afterwards, I said, you know, this will probably be the biggest challenge I have to face as a superintendent. Well, three years later, we've, we've fought off state takeover and the corrective action plan and teacher sick outs. Um, whoever thought we would have a pandemic to deal with. Um, but, you know, we just got, that's, this, is what, this is what we're hired to do as superintendents, but I can say this. I, I talk to a lot of superintendents. It's, it's tough, hard times right now for everybody, but superintendents it is too, because there's just no right answers. Um, you know, if there were right answers or a playbook, we would be following it. If we had a course in superintendency school, we would, you know, we would go back to that textbook. And so we're all doing what we think is best and what is right for kids and families and trying our best to stay out of the politics of it. It's hard sometimes. 
Um, but, you know, I, I try hard to do that and do what's best for our kids, our employees, and our families. But what I'd like to talk a little bit more about is long-term in JCPS. And so, as Abby said, this is my 24th year in JCPS. I came here in 1997 and um, at, at Shawnee High School. There are advantages and disadvantages to hiring a superintendent internally. One of the big advantages is in a district this size for a superintendent to understand the challenges and the changes that need to take place, usually it takes two, three, four years. Um, even to learn the schools, it took me two years as superintendent just to physically get in every school. Now imagine coming to a district where you don't even know the schools or the sides of town or the history of the district. I've been in this district for 24 years, so I, I clearly have an understanding of some of the things, the challenges that we face, the great things that are happening in JCPS. Um, I think it would be tough to come into a district from outside because this job is so difficult that if you truly don't love what you're doing and love the people in this district, then it's gonna be hard to do this job. But I've been here for 24 years. Um, I know the history of the district. I have thousands of colleagues in this district and there's not a week that goes by in this community where I don't have a child that come, not say child, there are adults that come up to me and say, do you remember me? I remember when you said this. And I feel old because sometimes I don't even remember what school it was or what decade it was because they all look the same age to me. Um, and I usually have to say, when did you graduate? And then I get to place it. Um, but they always say something to me. I remember when you did this or said this to me and it made a difference. I don't know how you can be a superintendent in this tough job, in this tough world, if you don't have that love for this district. And I do. And I want to see change in this district. And so the first year I had this position, I was, I was interim. I was trying to get the job. Then my first full year in, you know, is really working um, to how are we going, what are the things that need to change in this district? And about a year ago, I put together a team and I said, okay, you know, we have to turn away from initiatives and programs and small changes. And instead, we have to look at um, foundation changes, fundamental changes, because if you go back 25, 30 years from right now, and I'll give you an example. I read an article about student assignment from the Courier Journal yesterday from 1989. And outcomes were exactly the same for students and the achievement gap was exactly the same. 1989, 31 years ago. Um, and so programs have come and gone, initiatives have come and gone, but if we look at the structure and foundation of JCPS since 1989, there have not been significant changes. And so over the course of the past uh, 12 months, I've been making the case about the changes that need to happen in JCPS, and I'll be clear about it, it's not popular, the investment that needs to be made in JCPS to make these changes. And so uh, I've been very passionate about it. I made a speech, my State of the District speech in February, where I laid out these points. So some of you might have heard this, and I'm sorry if I'm repetitive on this, if you've heard this, but I think these are the things that must change. These are not things that I just necessarily have decided. These are things that we have come together and said other cities that have made a commitment to these things have done this and they've been successful with this. And this is the roadmap to change outcomes for kids. And there is no better time to invest in JCPS and JCPS kids because I believe it is at the heart of racial equity. And all of our racial tension and social unrest that we have across this country now begs, it begs communities to invest in racial equity issues for schools and school districts and ensure that we have the same opportunity or even better opportunity when it comes to racial equity. So equity doesn't mean equality, it means giving kids what they need to be successful. So I challenge people, if you want to be a part of making change throughout this nation, we need to invest in education and we need to invest now. Shortly after I made that speech, uh, we went into COVID-19 crisis. We all know that economic downturn occurred. And for a time period, I said, well, 
we're gonna have to put this off for several years. And I understand the challenges that come with that. But then I had to look in the mirror and say, my job is to at least shine a light on what is needed to make this district better. And so I'm gonna do that and I'm gonna to continue to say and do what must happen in this district. The sooner it happens for this community, the better. The longer it takes to implement these things, the more problems we will have and the longer this will exist. And I will tell you this, in some things I will share with you right now, you will see if we don't act soon, this community is going to have significant issues around education. We have not, and I'll be specific, and, and we can blame JCPS for this, we can blame the community for this, we must take ownership as JCPS because this is probably a decade and a half behind. But it is time to do it now or we will have significant issues moving forward. And it is time to make changes so that we can have racial equity and we can eliminate this achievement gap, which every community is struggling with right now. But I believe this is the roadmap to get us there. So I'm gonna share my screen with you. Hopefully this works. Oh, I don't see it. How did I lose that? I'm sorry, folks, give me just a second. Let me try now. Mm -hmm. All right, somebody give me a thumbs up if you can see that. It's good, Dr. Excellent. Folio, it's good. Excellent. Thank you. And let me see if I can start it. I'm not good at this. Um, nope, that's not it. Oh, I think I, I'm sorry, I don't use Google Slides much. All right, here we go. I apologize for the delay there. So as I called this, this was the future state in JCPS. I'm convinced this is what has to happen. Um, if we want change in outcomes, and I will also say this, I am convinced this is not a piecemeal thing. We must do all of these things to be successful and to change outcomes for our students. And I believe this is investing in our students. And when we got together, we put this in five different areas that I believe are so critical to changing outcomes for our students. And they're a part, uh, there's several things and I'll go through each one of them briefly. First of all, increased instructional time for students. Second, school choice for all students. This is the student assignment plan. And I will not shy away from this and I'll tell you more about this. Resourcing our lower performing schools better. They're called CSI. Um, I was a principal of one of those, Doss High School, and I know intimately what needs to happen in those schools to be successful, especially with resourcing them. Transforming our facilities. This is the one that's gonna shock you the most if you haven't heard this, but this is a critical component to the success of JCPS. And finally, workforce and leadership development. We must invest in all five of these areas significantly in order to be successful. So first of all, instructional time, increasing this instructional time. We have not done this. We have not done this effectively like many other communities have done. So we have 175 school days. When we are in school in person, I want you to think about normal school. Each child goes to school for six and a half hours a day. We have a third of our students who miss 18 or more school days a year. So first of all, that's 33,000 students who miss 18 or more school days a year. We have half of our students who miss six or more school days a year. So first of all, we must address attendance in this community and that requires a community wide um, program and support around social issues, medical issues, mental health issues, safety. Um, but we are asking kids that are behind to catch up and they are going to school 18 less days than their peers. Second of all, where many communities have invested in is robust summer learning. So yes, we have a lot of great outside school time partners that provide, but they are piecemeal together. We need to ensure through JCPS that we get 10,000 students in extended summer learning opportunities, not just sitting in a desk, but engaging programs and summer opportunities. We need that at, at winter break and spring break. We need to extend learning for our kids outside of the school day. 
We did it last year. We had it we, for the first time, very successful, a thousand kids cost us $1.2 million. We need to do 10 times that. We need to get every child in this community into extended summer learning programs and improve our attendance. That's going to be a significant investment in year round learning for our students. Other cities like Boston, Massachusetts, Austin, Texas, and other cities that we strive to be like have done this for five to 10 years. JCPS has not done this. I'm not blaming anybody. I'm saying this what is, has to happen is increase instructional time. Second of all, there's a lot of talk about student assignment um, and it is difficult talk. Um, and, and I have seen the issues with student assignment. I wanna be clear about this. I am not a proponent of just saying, let's go back to neighborhood schools. Every city in America now provides choice for children. I'm a believer in school choice, meaning when a, when a student raises their hand and says, I want to go to a school for a particular purpose, program, activity, pathway, they will be much more successful. As I said, when I got in, my daughter goes to y Pass because she loves musical theater. That is her sense of student belonging. So I believe every student in, Je in Jefferson County should have the opportunity to choose a school and to go to a school closest to their home if that's what they would like to do. But what we have not done since 1984, we only have one area of town that is expected that does not have choice. Every other community in the city of Louisville, when a kid goes to middle or high school, every single one, that child has the opportunity to go to a school in their neighborhood, middle and high school. The only students for the past 36 years who have not had the opportunity to do that are students of West Louisville, District 1. Those students have not had any choice unless they can be accepted to a magnet and they have not been allowed to go to a school close to their home if that's what they do. I believe this is what has led to a lack of investment in West Louisville. And so the last middle or high school that was, bet, that was built in West Louisville was 1952, the new Central High School, which that facility is past end of life right now. And that just shows the lack of investment that we have had in West Louisville, and we have got to change that. And so I believe we need to invest in middle and high schools in West Louisville. We need to give our students who have not had choice an additional choice, meaning they can go to the school closest to their home, or they can continue to go to a school outside of their community, which we call their satellite community. It, but it is going to require that we build great schools in West Louisville with great programs. And that's what we have to do, but we have to give students choice. Um, I have seen, I read that article in 1989 about how, and Dr. Cosby was actually quoted in that article about disinvestment from West Louisville. Um, and I think now it has been 31 years since that article and it is time that we invest in West Louisville and give every family in this community the right to go to school close to their home or to choose a school outside of their community if that's what they would like to do. Third, and I, I'll, I will spend the most time on this because it is the most dire, we are in the most dire position that you could possibly be in when you look at our facilities. And we can, we can say, um, all kinds of things that should have happened, but we, this is where we are right now. We are in a dire position when it comes to facilities. I want to be very clear about this. We have 32 schools that are past end of life right now. I mentioned one, Central High School. And when I say end of life, that means at any time, they could be shut down, closed, um, because they are end of life and not safe for students. And so when we are back in school, if we do not address this quickly, that will become a reality in the next decade in Jefferson County, where we close, have to close schools because they are condemned and we have to send kids to other schools that are not their choice because we've condemned buildings. The last high school we built in this community was 1968, Ballard High School. By the way, we condemned their football field last fall and they couldn't play any home games. Um, and so that's Evan. We have a high school in West Louisville who has had a condemned third floor 
Shawnee High School since 1981. And if I pulled the principals that are on this call right now and had them tell you about their facilities, we would be embarrassed to be in a community that has facilities like we have right now for our children. And, and, I'm, and I know I'm being very assertive when I say this, but when I go into other cities across this country that we all strive to be at, they have brand new schools, well-lit classrooms and schools, wide hallways, safety measures throughout the school, great ventilation, um, and I could go on and on, uh, auditoriums that are top-notch, gymnasiums and, and athletic fields that are top-notch. All you have to do, people, is drive to 60 miles um, east of here and drive around the high schools in Fayette County and then drive around the high schools in Jefferson County. And I think you will see exactly that the investment that JCPS and this community has made in our schools. We are coming to a tipping point with our facilities and we must invest in them. This comes in what's called bonding capacity in order to uh, increase our bonding capacity, which is like a loan. When we build facilities or renovate facilities, what we have to do is increase, we have to uh, get a loan like a mortgage, pay it over 20 years. We need to increase that capacity to do that by increasing our revenue. We are at, I will say this one more time, we are at a tipping point. Fayette County has invested in their facilities in two nickel taxes over the past 10, 15 years. We have never done that in Jefferson County and you see a difference in Oldham County and Fayette County and every city that we strive to be like. We must do something and we must do it quickly. If we do not address this, there will be significant issues with facilities in this community in the next decade. The next one is resource our low performing schools. I believe we must be invested in smaller class sizes we must be invested in our support services, mental health professionals. We put one in every school last year. That's just the tip of the iceberg. I believe we need community schools, um, and I've seen other cities do this, where we partner with uh, metro government, nonprofits, and we bring these services to the school building. Uh, we are going to build a school in West Louisville connected to the new Y at 18th and Broadway that will allow students to walk right into Norton Healthcare or walk right into the dentist or the mental health professional that's in that facility and get treated right away. Those are the type of support services we have to give our kids, especially our needy kids. I'm gonna say this, and, and I repeat this number a lot, in Jefferson County Public Schools, as of last year, we had 6,000 homeless students in JCPS. 6% 6 of our population have housing insecurity. Two thirds of our kids have food insecurities. And so we're gonna to have to step up and meet the needs of our children as a community. I believe these must have the best career and tech ed programs, the middle and high school with the best labs, the best training labs that they could possibly have to give them the, that uh, career readiness that they need to be successful. And I'm a firm believer that we need to pay our teachers more and pay our leaders more in, these, in schools that um, have much greater challenges. I was the principal at Doss High School where one third of the students were either English second language or, or special education. That requires a, um, a different type of leadership. And I believe those principals, those principals from Iroquois and Western that are on here should be paid more to do that work. And then finally, improving workforce and leadership development. I'm going to say this, um, not to be an alarmist, but we, in the next decade to come, we have a teacher crisis across America. Um, the amount of teachers that are going into post-secondary uh, programs for certification um, is decreased by 50% in the past decade. People are just not going into teaching. So we are going to have to develop our own teachers in collaboration with the University of Louisville and other um, partners around here. But um, so we have what's called a teacher residency, which they're actually working in our classroom and going to UofL at the same time. Um, those, someone who has a bachelor's degree, and we are putting them right into a classroom to be trained in our high need schools, getting a master's degree in one year, and going right into our schools. And most importantly, working to find teachers of color um, so that we can reflect our student population. 
Well, we've got to have the best teachers in the entire region. We've got to keep them. And finally, this is something JCPS has not done well. And all of our business leaders on here know about the importance of leadership training, developing our leaders to be great leaders and investing in our next generation of principals and leaders because the principal is the most important person for the success of an entire school. And so um, all of these, and there's many things that go into them, um, are critical for the success of student outcomes. It's not about a new program. It's not about a new initiative. It is about changing the fundamentals, the foundation of JCPS and investing in kids in this way so that we can, if we do these things, I am convinced 10 years from now, we will have a different um, school system and we will have very differing outcomes for our kids and especially our neediest kids, um, our students of color, our English language learners and our special education students will have different outcomes. And I know that's what we want as a community. And most importantly, as we compete with other cities that are like us, we need to invest in our students like they do. Um, so I appreciate the time you've given me to talk about the future state and I'm happy to answer any questions that anybody has about what I've talked about or anything else. Dr. Polio, thank you so very much and for your uh, commitment and dedication and most of all for your leadership. We do have several questions here and so I'll just start with the first one. Um, how does the district evaluate the early college program at Western High School and might it be expanded and what would be the considerations? Yeah, so the early college program, I know we've had some success there. Um, there's been some challenges there in increasing the numbers. Um, but I think it's been um, very successful in the fact I remember giving a scholarship to a young lady from Western, um, it was either this year or last year, we do a, a scholarship where she was walking out the door with her um, associate's degree already. Um, so expanding those numbers is important. And I think um, Anthony would tell you right now, our enrollment at Western is lower um, than what we want it to be. And so we're looking at some options for that school as well. But what it does, enrollment speaks to the fact that our, and I'm going to go off a little bit here, enrollment um, in our um, schools, especially in Southwest Louisville and Southwest and South Louisville, speak to the infrastructure problem we have. And so I'm, I'm, I'm circling back to facilities a little bit. From 1950 to 1970, this community built 48 schools. 48. Now, I want you to think about what the population where people lived from 1950 to 1970. From 2000 to 2020, we built four schools. So the contention and the problem here is think about how the demographics and population has shifted in Jefferson County. It's moved significantly east. We have not responded by building schools. So right now, we have schools in Southwest Louisville, high schools I'll just talk about, Western, Doss, um, Fairdale, um, Valley, um, PRP, and Butler, and several of those schools are at about 50 to 60 percent capacity right now because they were built at a time when the population was much greater in South Louisville. We have not responded appropriately, so a part of our programs and student assignment change will be to bring some much better options to a school like Western High School, where more kids will get in the early college program, because clearly that's the measure we want are the amount of kids coming out that have that associate's degree or college credits. Right. Um, you've already kind of touched on this, but the question is the achievement gap data is sobering, especially for African American boys not reading by the third grade. Is there anything else that you'd like to share about what's being done to identify and support these students? Yeah, well, what I'll say is, um, you know, when you look at almost every city in America, it's, it's the same sobering data right now, to use that term. I was at a, a conference, the Council of the Great City Schools, which is the top 76 schools, districts in the United States by enrollment. And I'm sitting at a large table with uh, New York, Miami, Chicago, every city you could think of that's the top 76. And we're all trying to put our heads together. And this was about a year and a half ago to think about how we can address this issue that we were all struggling with. And that one focused on black males specifically. And so we all had very similar data. 
um, with achievement gap. And I'll say once again, I looked at that 1989 article and the sobering part was the data was almost exactly the same in 1989. And so that's why I have to say it's not about a program. It's not about an initiative. Um, we have had accountability to try to change things for the past two decades. Let's increase accountability on educators and that will change it. That hasn't been the answer anywhere either for the past 20 years. And I believe this, you can disagree with me on this. This is fine. Research is clear on this. Money matters. Those cities that have invested in foundational programs like I just said, which is 10,000 students and primarily black students um, and at-risk students and bringing them in in summer learning programs, that makes a difference. Research is clear on that. And so it's not a program, it's not an initiative, it's let's increase the amount of time the child is in school and let's wrap our arms around them and support them. And those are not, and I'm gonna say this, there's not, everyone in education wants one switch to pull to say this is what we do, there isn't, there isn't that. What it takes is several, many years of investment and step-by-step -step work to support kids. And like I said, 10,000 kids, in summer learning, more choice, better facilities, uh, better teachers, uh, more supported teachers and leaders in our neediest schools. You know, those are the things that have to happen if we want to reduce that achievement gap. Yes, thank you. Um, this is a question from Jean West. Um, early childhood education is critical in forming so many of the skills and values that will be important in life. Should there be more resources and attention to the early years? Yes, without a doubt. Um, and I think research is clear about how important the early years, um, even the first six months are on a child's development. I am a believer in um, universal pre-K, um, but we have some issues with that. We have some issues with um, um, universal pre-K and getting all of our students there. And so, you know, the Head Start issue from two years ago, um, when um, we relinquished that and pretty much had to, we had no choice. Um, the federal government has not given a dollar of that money. They were given $15 million a year to Jefferson County for Head Start. So we have lost out as a community now $30 million over the past um, two years of federal money to support that. Now, JCPS has picked up those seats, but if we want universal pre-K, first of all, they must give us the Head Start money in this, and it's not JCPS given, it would be outside, but they must give that. Secondly, we were gonna have to invest about 3,000 seats more, and we have to get the word out to parents and families and encourage every parent to get their child in pre-K. So it's a communication issue as well. Um, high quality, universal pre-K is, is mandatory for success. Mm -hmm. Very good, thank you. Um, here's one from Ashley Brower. High impact family engagement is shown to improve academic and life outcomes for children in schools. How is JCPS addressing this during the pandemic when in-person programming isn't possible? Yeah, well, um, you know, it's, it's not easy, I'm gonna say that. Mm -hmm. um, it, it, it's never easy, parent engagement is never easy, family engagement is never easy. Um, it's one of the reasons why I want to give choice to families in West Louisville to attend school close to home. So I wanna paint a quick picture for you. Um, we have um, families that live in um, West Louisville who their only option to go to school is to go to Ramsey Middle School. That is their middle school. So Ramsey Middle School is at Billtown Road and the Gene Snyder. So that family, if they're not accepted to a magnet, their only choice is to go to Ramsey Middle School. I believe that's 24 miles as the crow flies to get from a house to get to Ramsey Middle School. Now I believe this, that student should still have the choice if that family wants to, but they should also be willing to say, I would like to go close to home so that we can be more engaged as a family in the school community. By the way, that child then, their high school that they reside, that they go to is Doss High School, which mm -hmm. is deep in the South End. And so we are asking a student and their family to go to middle school at Ramsey, Billtown Road out well past J-Town, and then go to high school at Doss. 
And then we wonder why that is inhibiting family engagement. Now, once again, they should have that choice. If they wanna do that, fantastic. But they should also have a choice of going close to home. That's long-term. Short-term, we've worked hard on communication, but honestly, it's a, it's a big challenge in COVID-19. Um, I will say this as an educator for 24 years. Uh, unfortunately, the school district and schools are being challenged um, all too often to mitigate problems of society. And so I would challenge all of us to say, what can we all do to help parent engagement? I know the Rotary steps up a lot to do that, and I appreciate that. Um, but all too often, what I've seen is, um, and I'll give another example. What's JCPS doing to bridge the digital divide? Okay, we can give Chromebooks to kids, and we can give some hotspots, but bridging the digital divide should be a community challenge. That should be for government, nonprofits, foundations, um, uh, local businesses. We should all work together to bridge that divide and say, you know what, it's unacceptable that 75% of the homes in West Louisville do not have access to high-speed internet when in East Louisville that number's like 20%. Mm -hmm. So that's a digital divide that JCPS has no capability of bridging. We must be at the table, but we need to do that together. Yes, very good. Um, this is a question about your perspective on charter schools. Do they advance educational opportunities for students? So I'm, you know, I'm very clear about this. I'm a public school guy um, and I'm a strong public school advocate and I will never step away from that. I've been a public school advocate for 24 years. Um, and we'll, my mom was a teacher in a public school. My dad was a teacher in a public school. I went to public school. My daughter goes to public school and wouldn't have it any other way. Um, and so obviously I'm not a supporter of charter schools. I think there are charter schools out there that are successful. And I'll tell you one of two things that charter schools do that lead to success. Number one, they increase instructional time. So instead of six and a half hours, they get kids in school eight hours a day. That's what the future state says, let's increase instructional time. Number two, they provide the wraparound services for the students and families. That's in, the char in my future state that we talked about. Those are things we must do as a public school district. But if a charter school does those two things well, they can be very successful. So I would not get into the debate of whether it can be successful or can't be. Of course they can be successful. What I will tell you is the problem. Anytime we take funding away from public schools, all right, a charter schools, if charter schools open up in any city, um, it takes social capital from the parent and the family to apply for a charter school. So you're already separating out a certain amount that has that social capital to navigate the system. That takes funding away from the school system. If we take 50 kids, or let's just say 20 kids from every school, we still have to fund that school at the same way. And who is left in the public schools? The 6,000 homeless kids will still be in JCPS. Mm -hmm. The 13,000 special ed kids will still be in JCPS. The 11,000 English language learners will most likely still be in JCPS. And we will still have to fund our students at the same rate. And so what you sometimes are taking away from in the charter world is funding from the neediest of students. Um, and so I'm not gonna debate whether they can be successful. I'm not saying that. I am just not a proponent of them. I think we need to invest in our public school system. Okay, this is a question about, um, about that very thing. How does Louisville spending per student look compared to peers and also since 1989? Yeah, so um, it's hard to say. I mean, we can look at 1989 dollars. They're roughly the same from 1989 dollars. Let's look at a couple of factors though that I wanna talk about with student funding that are some of the untruths around student funding. So you could find cities uh, that fund their students and their schools at much higher levels than us. I would challenge you this. Um, every time I hear a, a someone say, look at the school district in Boston, Massachusetts, they're very successful. What you find is it's one of the highest funded school systems in America. And those at the bottom are some of the lowest funded school systems. So I'm not gonna say we're at the lowest, um, but first of all, all of the data around school funding is different from state to state. So when we do school funding, we put everything in. So when we take out $110 million 
capital loan to build a school, that goes into the budget, $110 million, but that's not necessarily per student funding. Um, however, I will say this, when we talk about around $16,500 per student, most of, and then I hear out there that it's compared to private schools, why is it more? Most of our schools are around 10 or $11,000 per student to fund those students. But we also have, which most people don't know, we have residential state agency schools where kids actually live there. They come from other counties. Um, they might have, they might be foster children. Um, their parents might have been sent away because of drug abuse. We, JCPS is the one that takes them. We have Churchill Park. If you go into Churchill Park, which is the school for our neediest special ed students, and you walk in that school and there is one adult to one child. I mean, you will never walk out of Churchill Park without the best feeling about what's happening in that school. They have a pool in that school, a therapeutic pool, and you watch the teachers get the children into the pool out of their wheelchair to give them therapy. And I mean, it is one of the most moving things you've ever seen. That cost is about $70,000 a student. And so usually people throw that number in our face to say, well, it's $16,500 a student, which is more than going to a private school. There are no private schools that have, to, that have to educate every single student like that, like we do, whether that's Churchill Park, Waller Williams, Benet School, State Agency Schools, um, or um, there's no other district that takes everybody and says, you know, um, likes out in the state and opens up schools like Churchill Park. So. Um, those are some facts that I think are important to know, and I want to say this, I am committed to evaluating every cent we spend to make sure that, that we're doing things the right way and making sure we're getting as much funding to schools as possible. We're committed to doing that, um, but you know, those are some of the facts in per pupil spending I wanted to share. There are many um, comments about this, Dr. Polio, and asking how the Rotary Club can best support your work and initiative. If there's one, a couple of action items that you need the most, what would those be? Well, I would say, first of all, continue what you're doing, supporting our schools with scholarship. Um, I can't say that enough, folks. I mean, I have learned recently, and I did not even know this as a high school principal. We started giving out a scholarship my first year, I said, let's do an administrator scholarship where we ask, and I really thought just like central office administrators, because we all have this bad name, all the central, let's give money out of our paycheck every two weeks to go to a scholarship. Employees jumped in. We've raised $80,000 each of the past two years to do that. And I got to go around and give scholarships to kids, big checks. It was a lot of fun. But what I learned when I made the kids come in and talk to me and say, what's your plan for college? The, the scariest part about this is how many kids are going off to college, and I'm talking four-year schools, University of Kentucky, University of Louisville, who have one semester or one year paid for, and they have no idea what they're going to do two through four. And I ask them, what are you going to do? And they're like, I don't know, I'll figure it out as I go along. And that makes kids so often, they get to the end of the first year, there is no option, and they come home. So your scholarship, I can't say enough, your investment is so important with us. Being involved in those schools as much as you can, Western, Iroquois, any other school, we're gonna start once we get back called our Backpack Coaches. We're gonna be looking for volunteers to go into our elementary school and mentor children. We used to have a great reading program in JCPS. As soon as we can get back safely in person, we're gonna to wanna to do that. And finally, I would just say be an advocate for JCPS. I know that, um, you know, there, there's a lot of um, people that many times talk negatively about public school, especially JCPS, um, but be an advocate for the work that we're doing and what we need for our kids, because I think this is the front for racial equity. If we want to change outcomes for kids with the achievement gap, it's going to come through JCPS. That's where it's going to be. So we all need to be invested in it. That's what's going to have to happen. Um, and so whether it's me or somebody else down the road, in some way, it's JCPS that's going to make a difference in equity issues, and that's what we have to do. Thank you for that. And I want to recognize several Rotarians um, that are very involved in the Jefferson County Public Education Foundation, Franklin Jelsma, uh, Meredith 
Erickson, Henry Heiser, Mitch Rue, Ken Salvaggi, and Carl Thomas. We just thank you for your leadership with that organization, which we know is vital to JCPS. And um, thank you, Dr. Polio, so very much for being with us. Um, and Abby, we will get the rest of the questions to you. Uh, you wrote a comment that you could get those answered because we are out of time. So again, thank you very much, Dr. Polio, and to your entire staff. We appreciate your dedication and all you do for, our, for everybody. They are all our kids. We appreciate right. it. Thank you and very much. As a reminder, um, we are going to be uh, celebrating Derby next week, and we're delighted to have Kevin Flannery, president of Churchill Downs, with us. And please register your guests with Alyssa. Just send her the emails of the people you'd like to join with us next Thursday. And those that are interested in membership, stay on the call here, and we will have our brief What is Rotary session. This meeting is adjourned. Thank you all so very much.